hello, I'm RJ Kozane. You know me by now as the host of PGH Art Talk right now with pghmuseums.org. I sat down with Brian McCormick, who works with oils and canvas, among some other mediums, uh, paints everywhere. And it's as an artist, you want to grab a notebook right now because you're going to jot down so many notes. We talked so much about how to strike a balance in the day and find out like little niches to create when you're busy. Uh, It's an 18 hour day, spoiler alert. So prepare yourself, get up early, do the work. That's the Cliff Notes version of that. Um, We talk a lot about painting landscapes and uh, getting into painting Pittsburgh, some live painting here and there, lessons. There's so much. There's always so much, you know, I tell you every intro right after the break. We're going to get with it with Brian McCormick. PGH Museums is made possible through our affiliates, such as the Punxsutawney Weather Discovery Center. The Punxsutawney Weather Discovery Center is an interactive science center devoted to weather and weather folklore located in a century old former post office in a town who's known for its weather predicting groundhog. The Punxsutawney Weather Discovery Center lets you become a tornado, make a thunderstorm, or even be a TV weather forecaster. We met up with the center's executive director, Marlene Leelock, to see if she's ever been caught playing with the green screen. (laughs) Yes, don't tell my board, but uh, yes, we play with the green screen all the time. It's fun. It's, uh, if you've never been in front of one of them, uh, you can pretend that you're doing the weather. Uh, You can also take one of the green capes that we have and make your body disappear. So, you know, there's all kinds of fun things that you can do with it. Has she ever forged a weather forecast and predicted a catastrophe? I can't say that I've done that, but that gives me some food for thought. (laughs) You can create your own weather apocalypse forecast and learn everything the center has to offer at the Punxsutawney Weather Discovery Center. Discover more at weatherdiscovery.org. Hello, I'm RJ Kozane, and you are watching PGH Art Talk for pghmuseums.org. We are back with another artist. This is Hello. Brian McCormick. Thank you so much for coming and joining us with us. Absolutely. Thanks uh, for having me. Yes, thank you. I was perusing your Etsy last night and mm-hmm. saw so many different things. So I just wanted to start off right off the bat, which is asking, in your own words, mm-hmm. what do you do? Like, what materials do you work with? What kind of painter are you? Yeah, so, you know, I think like a lot of painters, or maybe not, I don't know, but... I definitely work with a lot of materials, but then there are some materials that I work with a little bit more than others. So, you know, certainly sketchbooks, you know, pen and ink. I don't really do a lot of like graphite, charcoal, that sort of thing, just Mm -hmm. because it always seemed messy to me. And then you'd always had to like fix it with a fixative. So I do a lot of sketching with pen and ink. I really like brush pens. They're fantastic because you can get really sharp points and you can get really broad strokes. And it's also really good for brush lettering, which I have found is really nice for your packaging when you're painting. Yeah. And I I like watercolor, but I actually got into gouache a little bit more. What is gouache? Gouache, I'm yes. i cut you off right there because yes. I don't know. Gouache is a medium that was really traditionally used with illustrators. So think of all the old timey like sign paintings or not necessarily sign paintings, but like ads in old magazines and things like that. Okay. So it's kind of a crossover between watercolor and say oil painting mm-hmm. because it's a water-based medium, but it is also opaque. So it's easier to get into. It's a nice transition from say like a watercolor into oils because it's easy to clean up. You don't need solvents and you can also start building layers. So it's it's really nice for going out and painting in the field or, or plain air, that sort of thing. Mm-hmm. Just going to museums, airplanes, like all that kind of stuff. It's fantastic for traveling. Nice. Mm-hmm. And do you, so you mentioned all those places. Do you have, so we're in your studio. We like to invade houses on this. Sure, yeah. Yeah. Uh, do you do a lot of stuff outside of the studio? Or are you mostly here? Recently, I've been doing a lot of stuff in the studio, and certainly if I go on different trips and things like that, I'm always going to be taking, you know, usually my gouache set with me. Um, Not so much oils, um, but I would like to start taking my oils more places. I do oils locally, so I have a, a French easel over there in the corner that... 
they're really great. They're heavy. They're kind of like brick houses, which is nice because they're not going to blow over in the wind. You need that, yeah. Um, but they're really nice. They can house a lot of different things in there. I also have a, a light aluminum easel that I'll take out into the field. I like to go to places like Shenley Park, you know, sometimes after work because it's on my way home. And it's really a fantastic place because you have that view of the city and it, you get that atmospheric perspective there. And it's really, really nice. So, yeah. For sure. And um, so you do it on the way from home or mm -hmm. from work on the way. So yeah. is there a balance that you, we talk a lot on this podcast about trying to like strike a balance between working and getting creative work done because so many people, especially in Pittsburgh, have to have the job. Oh, sure. Absolutely. Yeah. yeah and I think a lot of painters, even if they're painting, quote, full time, a lot of people have multiple streams of income. Yeah. Um, I think there are probably few people that just paint and make 100% of their income from the paintings. Everyone who paints should, but they don't. <laughs> <laughs> right. And so I think a lot of people teach, a lot of people do workshops, and then a lot of people paint. There's, you know, YouTube. I mean, there's so many things to generate multiple streams of income. And I think that's really smart mm -hmm. to be able to do that. So for me, it is nice. I would like to eventually transition into a more painting-based stream of income. But right now, it is nice having a job that has that steady stream of income coming in, health insurance, those different types yes. of things. But but it's really for me about carving time out throughout the day. And I try to talk about this a lot in YouTube videos or on Instagram about it's really about finding that little bit of time. And people always say, you know, I don't have time to paint. Well, maybe you don't. That's always possible. But I be, would be willing to guarantee that someone has at least maybe five to 10 minutes a day that they can carve out. Um, for me, I usually do it in the morning when I'm getting up, getting ready for work. I'll usually take an hour in the morning. I'll do an oil painting in the morning. So all of these in the morning before work because okay, when I get that's home, impressive. I'm, I'm usually just sacked because I'm just tired Dead, and mentally I, I eat dinner. And usually it's because like I get home and I eat dinner and then I'm just like, Ugh, you know, I'm tired. Yes. So I reserve a lot of kind of, I guess, operational things for the evenings. So I'll, I'll prime panels, I'll gesso them, and then I'll also wash brushes sometimes. But I've gotten pretty good with my brush management so that I don't have to do that a lot. And I can always talk about that later on if you want me to. Yeah. But it's it's all about, for me, carving time throughout the day. Um, lunchtime, I'll go to Starbucks and I'll draw people. So I okay. used to take, I have a little Peshad box over there, which is basically just like a travel box that you can paint in. Mm -hmm. And I would take that, but I decided that like recently I want to focus a little bit more on drawing, kind of honing those skills down. So I'll just go to Starbucks, you know, have my, you know, decaf Americano, and then I'll just do quick gesture sketches of people. And there's just something about working from life that really forces you to work fast and quickly. Yes. So, <laughs> so I carve all these different things out. So it's usually morning, lunch, and then evening. So it's, it's a full day, you know, it's probably 18 hour a day between like full-time job this it's you know you really have to dedicate a lot of time to it um, you do this is all goals for me too because i i have a day job i know some people in the creative field do not and it's a uh, even more of a struggle because mm -hmm. you mentioned health insurance and sure like, how does this like happen and it's, right either way you look at it it's such like a dedication to trying to carve out and figuring out how you're going to live how you're going mm -hmm. to have the income and how are you going to do something that you're like so mm -hmm. passionate about I have the management in the evening done because I think that's all you can do once you're so drained. Right. I need to set an earlier alarm because if you're <laughs> doing all of this before work, I'm not doing that. I rolled out of bed five minutes before I came here and was like, I have to get here. So that is, that's wisdom. Write that down if you're an artist listening yeah. to this. Well, and I even heard a story one time. There was a, a guy who wanted to get more creative time into his day and he didn't have a lot of time so he figured out that he had five minutes in the morning when he was putting his tea in the kettle okay. and so he kept a sketchbook next to the kettle so while the water was boiling he would sketch out a teacup 
and he had like 365 teacups throughout the year. So, you know, sometimes it's not about how much you can do. Yeah. It's about the momentum. And if you can keep even like a small thing going for a long period of time, then when you do have more time to expand a little bit, you now have the momentum going. So instead of starting from just, you know, a dead stop, you can expand that momentum a little bit more and it makes it a little bit easier. Yes. And there's so many times where I'm doing something like making tea mm -hmm. and I wish that I have like something next to me that I could do something. Now I just know to implement it. Right. And it reminds me, I read a book, uh, it's called Daily Rituals. Mm -hmm. It's just like all of these creatives and like even political figures who would log their day almost hour by hour. Absolutely. And they would do the same thing every day and do what you're saying. It's just right. carve the time in. Yeah. And I've definitely, you know, tried to do that as well. I mean, it's, it's even to the point now where if I'm at a red light, I mean, I'm, I'm on Instagram, I'm commenting i'm you know connecting with people i mean every ounce of time that i have i mean I, you know and then the other thing that i'm gonna have to figure out how to do is these are all for a show so i don't have them posted for sale yet mm -hmm. so that's gonna be i'm gonna have to figure out how to like post everything to etsy and get everything up there so yeah it's a lot <laughs> yes it's always a lot uh these are for show what show is coming up where can we see so these? a friend of mine told me about this so it's the the fun a day show 2020 it's okay. at the the casey droge project space in wilkinsburg mm -hmm. so everybody just made one thing a day or you know th there was no hard rules it was like that's the goal but if you know you make a yeah. you skip a day or whatever no big deal and so it's usually you know one thing a day for january and they're gonna have the show I think the the opening is the 29th at like six o'clock. Okay, nice. Mm -hmm. So we have a lot of landscapes uh, be both behind us and over here too. I don't think the camera's picking up. No, nope, <laughs> but we'll show it later. It's fine. Sure. Uh, do you, is that primarily what you, you like to draw or what are the subjects? So you mentioned drawing people in Starbucks. Right. And I saw some um, ink paintings of people on the Etsy. Yeah. Uh, is that like, what are the primary subjects that you like to to work with so landscapes just for me they're they're pretty easy to crank out because they're a little forgiving you know if you're doing tight realism with the figure i mean yes. i would not be able to do one a day you know mm -hmm. so so for something like this it's a little bit more expressive and it's a landscape you know if a bush or a shadow is just a little bit more this way. People aren't gonna be like, "Hey, wait a minute, that's out of place." So I would hope not. <laughs> you're right. So, so with that, I do like the landscape paintings. I do really enjoy figure drawing and figure painting, and I'm trying to hone that a little bit more. Um, I really like the the ink washes with the like the Japanese brush, like the Sumi paintings, that yeah. sort of thing. So, and those are, you know, pretty easy to do because that style is just quick marks. It's not a lot of detail. It's actually supposed to be the essence of the shapes. And okay. so I really like that style. Um, I kind of bounce back and forth between liking to work on a painting with a little bit more detail layering it building it up working it over time and then you know i also like these little like tasty tidbits that i can just crank out in an hour or so and move on to the next thing so yeah. there's like two sides of my personality that really likes to be like oh moving on to the next project i'm gonna do another painting and another painting and another painting and then you know i'll usually have like one or two larger ones that I'm going to work on, build up a little bit more. And they're usually commissions. You know, if someone's commissioning a painting, I'm usually going to put a lot more time into that instead of just whipping it out in like an hour or so and be like, right. done, <laughs> you know, so. Yeah. Uh, d in terms of like the subject, so if you're doing something detailed as opposed mm -hmm. to something that's like a little bit more whimsical and free, mm -hmm. is there like something, do you have to be in like a certain mood or is there a certain like what makes you say to do something like, something detailed oriented that's over here versus something that's like a little bit more free and flowing. Yeah. So I definitely have found that my energy levels are definitely, you know, higher earlier in the day. Once I wake oh, yeah. up, I'm up and I'm ready to go. What's your secret to that? First I have no idea. I've just, <laughs> I'm still dragging. I need coffee and I don't even know what to wake up. It's like one o'clock during the week at work where I'm like, I'm on. 
and yeah. I get there at eight. So the hardest part for me hours. is just getting out of the bed. Okay. Once I'm out of bed, then I'm up, you know, and you know, I, I'm not like, Oh, I need to go back and take a nap. I've, you know, I've never really been much of a napper. Definitely not a napper. I feel like you have to fill the day. Like you said, like sure. eight, it's an 18 hour day all of the time, basically. Yeah. When I nap, I just get mad at myself. <laughs> but if that's the secret, I don't know if I can work with that, but I'll try. Yeah. I guess. You can do it. Yes. But as you. far as the, the subject matter, definitely I would probably be willing to say that I would probably be doing something that's maybe a little bit more detailed earlier in the day. Okay. That and makes then, sense. you know, I'll do the, the ink washes in the evening just because... Now, I have an easel. You know, this is the other thing, too, is I have painting and easels and sketchbooks at pretty much, like, every place in my house, in my car. Okay. Um, so that's another tip that I'll mention. But um, I have the, the Sumi paintings out in the kitchen. So that way I can be making dinner, and I can just go over, and then I can just brush that a little bit, and yes. then go over and cook dinner a little bit more. But that really is a nice secret in that... If you have it in front of you, you're going to be more likely to do it and you're going to be more likely to feel that you have the time to do it. Um, you know, it's just like, you know, playing an instrument or something like that. If you have it in the case, in the closet, you're going to be less likely to go in because it's a process. But, you know, yes. I have my guitar sitting out in the open. I've heard once that Keith Richards kept his guitar next to his bed so that when he would dream up a riff, he would just wake up, grab his guitar, and he'd be able to play it and then yeah. remember it. Yeah. So it's that immediacy of removing any kind of barriers to entry and having it right in front of you. We are removing barriers with Brian McCormick <laughs> right now. Uh, thank you so much for being here. This is PJHR Talk with PJH Museums. Just wanted to take a little bit of time out to thank you. Thank Brian, the other Brian who is behind the camera and does <laughs> all of the fancy filming and things that I don't know how to do. Uh, and everyone who's watching, thank you. We, I could not be in, invading houses like this without your support and your support as well for Absolutely. being so gracious to offer this space. Uh, we do have a membership, and there's exclusive content over there. You get percentage off museums, galleries, all kinds of stuff. We're just starting out. We're all volunteer runs. This is fantastic that you're doing this and that you're watching and that he's back there doing. We don't know what Brian does off camera, but maybe I'll tell you a secret one day. Follow me on Twitter. <laughs> and uh, yeah, we are here with Brian. This is so many tidbits that are being shared right now that I feel like I need to grab a pen and start writing down right now. <laughs> Uh, and I probably will. We have a podcast version of this where I kind of like do a narrative after. Sure. So it's like this kind of video. And then I'll like splice up the interview and like retrospectively mm -hmm. put my thoughts into it. I just feel this one is going to be like, I'm taking all of this advice, <laughs> like every break in it. So this is all great. And, um, and we were talking about breaking down barriers and detail-oriented work versus not-so-detail-oriented mm -hmm. work. Do you find, like, the moods switch when you work from, like, different types of paintings? Because I know with music, mm -hmm. I make electronic music. We know this by now. 2020K, it's 2020, we know. Uh, so I will work with, like, textures, a lot of, mm -hmm. like, synthy textures, like, ambient kind of things, which are a lot more free-flowing. Sure. And I feel like if I'm stressed... I would rather work in like the more detailed like pop music realm where it's like so mm -hmm. much has to go into it as opposed to like something that's that, like calm and flowing. Right. Do you feel like you have to be in like a specific mood to work on something or is it because like these works over here remind me of like it's just so tranquil to me mm -hmm. and chill and I'm just like okay this is like ambient RJ whereas this is like I'm awake I've had five cups of coffee let's be a pop star. <laughs> Um, I don't know. I think it really goes back to, again, that now it's just become like a habit for me. You mm -hmm. know, it's, you know, this is, you know, what I do in the morning. You know, I, I make these in the morning. I do the, the brush paintings in the evening, you know, usually work um, something a little bit more detail. Um, the commissions that I've been doing, a lot of those, since there is actually more detail, actually, I'm kind of contradicting what I said before. Um, I was doing those in the evening after work just because... Um, I had a, a time limit on those and I had to deliver them by a certain time. So oh, yeah, deadlines change everything. Change yes. the whole world. <laughs> yes. Um, which is one of the reasons I actually tended not to do commissions, but the money's good. So, um, and you know, when someone presents something that is a, in a line with something that I like doing before, I would just, 
I would take things on just because, you know, people would say, hey, can you do this? And I'd just be like, yes, yes, yes. Of course. Yes. Absolutely. Um, and then it would just stress me out because it wouldn't be something that, you know, was in the realm of, you know, what I did often or it was a different medium or a different subject matter. Um, but now if someone comes to me and says, you know, I want a landscape or something like this or, you know, whatever that might be, I'm a little bit more likely to do it just because, right. yeah. What's something that's been like way out of your comfort zone or if you don't want to answer that which is fine because the art is out there in the world yeah what's something that you like have gotten out of your comfort zone and have been like okay that was very stressful but i am happy with the end result of that um i don't know that i've really done anything that's been too far out of my comfort zone i know that i've had some people ask me to do some things that have been a little bit more structural with Mm -hmm. buildings in them and while you know i do some of that and i'll sketch that a lot i don't necessarily feel comfortable with the results to deliver that as a commissioned painting to someone so i've kind of turned those down even though I'd really like to start doing that a lot more just because these are nice to do landscape paintings from around the world, but ultimately I'd really like to start painting Pittsburgh, you know, and what's around you. And I think that's ultimately kind of what kind of makes a painter in a way in that, you know, this kind of, when you see somebody's work, you can tell like, oh, this is where they were from, you know, sure. like Van Gogh painted just his neighborhood yeah. and, you know, Sargent painted, you know, the people that, you know, that he knew or, you know, worked with that sort of thing. So I would definitely like to start doing Pittsburgh a little bit more. Um, so I really haven't done anything that's been too far out of my comfort zone. Okay, cool. That's always a good answer. Yeah. You don't like to be too far out, too far stretched. Right, no. right. Uh, in terms of like painting Pittsburgh and getting into that, Mm -hmm. the first question that popped into my mind is because when you go on the Etsy or Instagram, wherever you're Mm -hmm. at, you, you sometimes will put where the actual scene is Mm -hmm. that you're painting. Sure. Uh, where do you like draw? So obviously Pittsburgh, you draw inspiration from what you're around. Right. When you're looking for something else to draw, that's like real and out there and in Mm -hmm. the world, do you have you been to the places that you've painted outside of the city or what goes into Um, thinking a a few places, you know, I do use some, you know, photo references, um, mostly from the parks around here. You know, I have some paintings that are from Shenley park Mm -hmm. and point state park, that sort of thing. Some of them come from just people that I know and they'll, you know, I don't know what it is about this summer, but Everybody seemed to be in like Banff and Alberta, which is a place that I really want to go. And so I'm like, oh my gosh, um, can I paint that picture? And they're like, sure, yeah, you know, because cool. they're not like professional photographers selling that work, that sort right. of thing. It was not like copyrighted or anything. So I would get it from that. Um, sometimes too, just Instagram. If I see something, again, you know, if the person is not a professional photographer, like if I saw something from National Geographic and I'm like, hey, can I paint that? They're going to be like, yeah, no. That's right. Cop- Let's that's go legal. It's going to take about like three years. Exactly. Then maybe you can paint it. Yeah. So there's definitely been a lot of Instagram photos that I've seen and I've just messaged a person and said like, hey, you know, can I paint this? And a lot of times they're like, absolutely. Nice. Um, and sometimes it turns into a sale because it's their own picture and they really like it. And so, so that's actually something that works out pretty well. Um, but for like these since I was trying to do one a day and I'm trying to continue doing one painting a day because it's built up such a great momentum and it just um, makes it a lot more fluid with just doing everything. It's just, it's kind of like a flow state. Mm-hmm. Um, I found this thing, it's called Map Crunch. So basically it's like Google Maps, but every time you hit the button, it takes you to a random place in the world. And I'll just sit there on my phone and I'll just hit the button until I find a composition that I like. And then sometimes it takes a while, you know, because sometimes it's like an alleyway or, you know, which some people can paint those amazingly well. Yes. Um, and I would like to get to the point where, you know, I could do that and be confident with it. But I'm usually looking for like big, big shapes, you know, big cloud structures, big um you know like here you know there's like a road that's a big shape over here the lake that's another big shape the 
sky wasn't that busy, but I'm usually looking for something that has four to five big shapes that you can break down into a composition and Sometimes it takes a while hitting that button. And sometimes when you're pressed for time, you just got to like take whatever you get and be like, well, this is my favorite, but I'm going to go with it for today. And just, you know, I've realized that um, not every painting is going to be my favorite painting. It's more about getting the process done and doing it. And then that'll enable me to move on to other paintings that I like a little bit more. Yeah. And in the music world, there's something, uh, there's a, like a subscription service that you can sign up for called mm -hmm. Splice. Yeah, a lot of people use it. It gets like kind of a bad rap sometimes because they'll just pull. It's basically samples that you oh, can yeah. use and uh, stick mm -hmm. in your song. Um, a lot of people just pull them out, and make a song, and then that's that. Mm -hmm. uh, I've signed up and I try to manipulate the crab out of them, but I do the mm -hmm. same thing that you do. If like I can't find something that I can make on my own, or uh, if I'm crunched for time, I'm just mm -hmm. there like button, 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 button. Right. Is this the sound I want? No. Yes. Okay. <laughs> and yeah, so I, I get that as well. And it seems like technology. As much as I feel like we've talked so far on the podcast about like whether or not it hurts or it helps art, mm -hmm. it feels like it helps so much with the creative process because there's so much out there to find and like look for. Absolutely. And I think at every stage of the game in at least modern and contemporary art, I think some sort of technology has impacted the way that, you know, artists have created. Every medium. The invention of the camera definitely helped right people there. to, you know, shift away from that. You know, I think that was one of the things that probably brought on Impressionism because prior to that, people were trying to be as detailed and realistic as possible. Well, now the camera can do that. Well, so what now are we're going, going to do now? You're going to have to go the opposite direction. Yeah. So. Yeah, and kind of switching gears a little bit, uh, since we talked about you painted in the park, you mm -hmm. painted after work, you painted here, you painted next to whatever in the kitchen. Mm -hmm. Where do we see you in the real world? Because I know that, so daily painting, you're everywhere. Mm -hmm. But I know that you've sagged into live painting a little bit, and you've mentioned commissions as well. Sure. What do you, where do we find you, like, out in the world, if it's not, like, Shenley Park somewhere? <laughs> yeah, absolutely. So, you know, I definitely have started doing live painting recently, and I can't even remember specifically how I got into it. Um, probably I just got more comfortable being out painting because I would go to the park and paint and people would always come out, come up and say like, oh, you know, well, what, you know, what are you doing? Are you painting? That <laughs> the sort nosy of people in the park. Yeah. You know, so, and, and that's great because for me, I think one of the things that I like so much about painting is not only the results and it's a very... I started doing it because it's a very meditative, calming thing. Mm -hmm. But now I've discovered that it's a, an amazing way to connect with people. You know, just if you're there painting, people are going to come up and talk to you. Sometimes you don't always want that because you're just like, oh, I just want to be in my zone. But it's still a good story <laughs> at the end of the day. It's fine. Absolutely. So the connection that you make with people is fantastic. So I started by just doing it on my own in the park. And then I think one thing just led to another. And um, maybe I haven't just pitched it and just said like, hey, I would live paint at your you know charity fundraiser, that sort of thing. So <clears throat> I've done a couple of those. I've got a, a couple more lined up. And it, that is a really great thing to do. It's it's really a win-win for both parties. You know, you're providing something of value to their organization. You're providing something unique that yeah. people can see and witness. Because I think for the most part, to the general public, painting is kind of this like mystical thing that they don't, you don't know how, like how does this end result come about? And like, how does it happen? Like, how do you start? Do you do it like a printer? Do you, you know, so right. for people to see how a painting is created and how maybe like it's drawn out and you start from like general to the specific. And so I think that's kind of a good thing for people to see that. And then it's also good for the, the creator as well, because you know, you're getting your name out there, you're making connections. And again, it's just a great way to connect with people, um, you know, and share that. And the connection part, I feel, is really great, too. Because as someone who's consumed art most of his life, there's been so many times where I've stood in front of, like, a painting and been like, this is beautiful. It's one of the most beautiful things I've ever seen. 
I don't know anything about them. And Mm -hmm. a lot of the times, unless it's someone like Van Gogh, Mm -hmm. you're not going to be able to go to Wikipedia and type in like an obscure artist who has like a small gallery open. Mm -hmm. So it's very nice to hear that uh, the connections are made through Mm -hmm. art and uh, especially painting because it seems like it's such a solitary experience. It feels very disjointed from me staring at it, getting my interpretation to Mm -hmm. you just sitting and working with it. Uh, and when you are working with it, you mentioned like also like how does this come about? How mm. does things start? And I ask that question, but I never think to ask it. So mm-hmm. how do things start with you? Is there something that like is common or is it all over the place? Like how to approach creating a painting? How would you approach something new? Like one of these that we will see. Mm-hmm. Um, like how would you go and think I should do that one today? Yeah, absolutely. So, you know... When I was growing up, it was always one of those things where, you know, you just see somebody that can draw really well and you just think, oh, you know, they just have this natural facility and they can just pour it right out of their brain onto Mm -hmm. the page and it's just detail straight out of their hand. And while there are a lot of people that can do that, it's taking them years to be able to develop that skill. And the way that I approach it is you really have to break it down into the the simplest things possible. And actually, a a lot of professional artists that um, do really detailed work start this way. Mm -hmm. You know, so for example, you know, with a landscape, you might just say, um, let's just break it up into the sky and then the, the land. And so you draw one line. So now you have two big shapes. And then you break those two big shapes down into smaller shapes. And then those shapes and the smaller shapes and then smaller shapes. And it just goes so on and so on and so on. And you can actually do this with the figure too. It's called enveloping where you basically just draw like a big geometric shape to get the general height and the width of something. So you might start off and say, you know, I'm going to draw a line down at your feet and then the head and then the width. And then from there, you might get the angles from like your head to your shoulder. And then from there, it's just you work from the general all the way down to the more specific. And eventually, you have something that's very detailed. And I found that to be very liberating in that when I approach something, I don't have to worry so much about it being perfect because I know that I can generally just keep working it down into more and more detail over time. There's a point in every interview where, like, my mind feels like it's expanding. <laughs> I think it's happened several times in this interview, but specifically there. Mm-hmm. I'm, I don't know how to paint at all. Mm-hmm. I wish that I could. I got the other mediums down. Painting mm-hmm. is something that I just, I, as soon as you said, I draw a line to separate the, like, planes. Why? What? <laughs> that's, that's, I know it's a very common thing. I'm sure everyone does it. But that's, Yeah tidbits all over the place and you mentioned well you didn't mention i fished through your email signature and you mentioned lessons and while you're going through Mm -hmm. that i was thinking like okay if you can explain how you create something in that like simplistic of a way which is not simple at all because none of these are simple period you'd be a fantastic teacher (laughs) so lessons um are you looking to start that or what can we expect out of like if i sit down with you for now and say teach me, I can't draw a stick figure. And mm-hmm. you're talking about all these beautiful drawings that you do at Starbucks. How does like a, a typical lesson go? Or what are we looking to approach with that? Yeah. So, you know, I've always really liked teaching. So for me, it's just a natural transition to want to take painting and be able to teach people how to do it. So through my job, I do a lot of lectures for local universities. So it's something that I've just kind of, you know, developed over time, Um, I'm very comfortable with it, you know, getting up in front of a big group of people and talking about different things. So it's just a natural transition to take that and then move it over into another skill and then be able to pass that along to people. Um, and I've just always had this thing where I would just always just connect something that people already kind of know how to do and like relate that to, to something else. So take something that's like abstract and complex and relate that to something that is commonplace and that people know already. Um, so I've always kind of had like a, a thing for like doing that. And that's kind of how I make sense of the world too. Mm-hmm. Like a lot of the way that I'll describe things 
Um, you know, people be like, oh, wow, you know, that's that's a weird way to describe that, but that makes a lot of sense. Um, so yeah, I, I really like doing that. And I haven't done any lessons yet, but I was approached when I was painting in the park and, you know, the family wanted to know if I would, you know, do some lessons for their kids. And I was like, sure, why not? Um, and I think that's another thing too, is sometimes you just have to jump in. You know, you're never yes. going to be pushing yourself as healthy. You're never going to be respect. fully ready for whatever it is you're going to be doing, whether it's never. starting a podcast or a YouTube channel. You know, you, you want to have some things in place before you get started. But, you know, sometimes you just have to jump in it and then you'll figure things out as you go. And so that's probably what I'm going to end up doing. Um, you enough. know, I definitely have a background in, in teaching, um, well, giving lectures. You know, I'm not a teacher by trade, but. Um, I feel that it's something that I would be able to do with painting as well. So if anybody's interested in learning how to oil paint, I can certainly, you know, start from there and you really have to know your audience. So whenever I'm giving a lecture, I will always try and figure out, um, who the students are, you know, what their majors are, what they're going to be practicing, what they're going to be doing so that I can tailor my conversation to them. So if someone wanted to learn how to paint, you know, especially for the kids, um, you have to figure out how old are the kids? they have any experience in painting, um, what do they want to paint? So you have to give people options. Some people might want to come in and they might just want to learn the basics. Like I just want to come in and do, you know, an hour and make a landscape and go home. Yeah. Other people might want to come in and say, you know, I want to learn the basics of oil painting. I want to learn how to mix colors. I want to learn composition. I want to learn values. I want to learn, you know, te color temperature, you know, all those details. Then you're going to have a more like of a build up. So you're going to have the first lesson, second lesson. So you really just have to know your audience. For sure. Yeah. And I, I did some teaching as well. Uh, I did some volunteering at WIP and they stuck me at one of the propel charter schools. Yeah. And they were like, here, teach grades kindergarten through seventh grade. Mm -hmm. And I was like, audio? Yes. How do you tailor that to like right. that much of an age range? And it was such a wonderful challenge. Like mm -hmm. that is one of the most fun challenges I look back on in my life so far. So that it's, it's really cool just trying to think of like, should I work with RJ and just teach him what a line is? But then what if someone from the park knows what a line is mm -hmm. and wants to know everything else? Right. So yeah, getting into lessons, I feel like is great. And if someone wants to have lessons with you, or if someone wants a commission or to buy something from you, or just to follow you, just to kind of wrap mm -hmm. up everywhere. I know you're everywhere, but where can people see you? So people can find me on, you know, Instagram, Etsy, Facebook. My my handle's pretty much the same. It's gallery G A L L E R Y dot B R Y. So just Google Gallery Bry. I'm the only Gallery Bry. It'll come up. Yes. You'll be able to find me. Um, yeah, you can find me on Instagram. You can e email me. You can call me. Um, I don't know if you put contact information and in show notes, that sort of thing. or We do now. <laughs> yeah, so we'll do that. Maybe. We'll see. That's Brian. He's behind the camera. I don't know what he does. But this is Brian as well. And thank you so much for being here. Uh, you can find us on pghmuseums.org, Apple Podcasts, Spotify, wherever the podcasts are at, the YouTubes, the Instagrams, the Twitters, and you can find me everywhere too. Uh, thank you so much for being here and for doing this. This has been fantastic. Absolutely. Thanks for having me. Yes, thank you. Sidekick Media Services. We are your sidekick in business for social media, video production, and more. Find out more at sidekickmediaservices.com. Thank you for listening to our talk from pghmuseums.org. Your host today was RJ Kozane, and the program was edited by me, Brian Crawford. Today's music was Wallpaper by Kevin McLeod and can be found at filmmusic.io. It is licensed through the Creative Commons. Be sure to search PGH Art Talk on Apple Podcasts, Spotify, or wherever podcasts are found. PGH Museums is made possible through our members and affiliate museums, such as the Punxsutawney Weather Discovery Center, Become a Tornado, make a thunderstorm, be a TV weather forecaster. You can do all of this and more at the interactive Punxsutawney Weather Discovery Center, located in the home of Punxsutawney Phil. Learn more at weatherdiscovery.org. We'll catch you in two weeks, right here on Art Talk from pghmuseums.org.